complicated We're automated And overpopulated We're all fish in a stream Swimming towards a vicious dream Hey, what's up guys? Matt here coming to you from Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. So I've got Nick and Andrew here as well. So there's a big movement going on right now that I think really can't be overstated. And that is a transition in the Sportster family that Harley-Davidson is going through right now. And I've talked about this before and I'm sure most of you have, have heard about the news. And that is that the air-cooled Evolution engine in the Sportsters are being phased out in lieu of the new Revolution Max platform. And so it's a really big turning point in Harley-Davidson's history. And and I feel like it can't be talked about enough because it's a huge transition for Harley Davidson. And so what I wanted to do was put together a video with Andrew and Nick, and we just took out the bikes, the Nightster and the Iron 883. We've also all ridden the new Sportster S as well that came out last year. We want to talk a little bit about the air-cooled Evo motor, how it compares to this new for short Rev Max platform that Harley Davidson has launched uh, this last year. We just saw the introduction of the Nightster as well that launched about April of this year, 2022 model year. And so so we have another bike in that Rev Max family. And so, you know, Harley Davidson, they've now had Sportsters. They've got a 65 year history of Sportsters. So the Sportster family and model is pretty much legendary in the motorcycle universe. And the Sportster family has been powered by the air-cooled Evo motor now for 37 years. And we saw the motor go rubber mounted back in 2002, 2003. Uh, something like that and we saw another you know significant upgrade with suspension and electrical around 2016 but it's gone relatively unchanged for a long time now and i think on one side of the, of the coin you have people that are critical of harley davidson for having old technology and on the other side of the, of the coin you have people that you know love the classic nature of your harley davidson so it's the typical harley davidson balance trying to figure out okay how do we maintain this classical look and and feel and appeal of a harley davidson but also give people modern technology and, and modern performance. So I think we're going to go through a couple different categories here. So we're going to first talk about the pros and cons of each. I think objectively on paper, it beats out the air-cooled Evo motor in pretty much every single category. But I think there's still, like I mentioned, alluded to earlier, there's still some things and factors that I think a lot of buyers, especially traditional Harley-Davidson buyers, might still prefer in the air-cooled Evo motor. I think we'll open it up to uh, Nick and Andrew here. In your guys' opinion, is it a good move for Harley-Davidson or not? Uh, absolutely, 100%. As a Sportster 48 owner, I think this is a big step in the right direction. Uh, kind of touching on what you said about some of the trade-offs and some of the stuff uh, that we had talked about before. I think some of those things will get alleviated with time. Customization for the Sportster lineup and having a lot of aftermarket backing for the Sportster, you know, uh, I was talking to Nick earlier and, and you were there about having an air-cooled Sportster and, you know, picking that bike, whether it's a 1200, a 48, an 883, you can pretty much turn it into anything you want. A flat tracker, you know, something to take to the canyons on a track day, a bar hopper, a bobber, whatever you want, you know, a Sportster frame. Or, or that whole lineup is going to be like the easiest choice in my opinion and and somewhat most cost effective and so you're so you're advocating for the benefit of the air-cooled evo motor the fact that it's got 37 years of aftermarket companies making parts for it and the customization opportunities are endless really i mean there's absolutely i think arguably no motorcycle out there or platform that has more custom parts made for it probably in the world yeah just because it's been around for so long and it's a harley yeah. davidson after all everybody wants to make parts for harley davidson so absolutely like i said in time like like nick mentioned in time i think that a lot of the aftermarket companies are going to get behind that and start building parts to customize the Nightster. And I think that's going to be really huge. Kind of like how Harley introduced all the builders and all these different companies customizing the Nightster to make it look super cool custom and, and the different styles across the world. I think there was a shop in Germany and, you know, Australia and stuff like that. So yeah, you're referring to their launch video, yeah, the launch video. The yeah. Instrument absolutely. of expression launch yeah. video. I think if anything to the, the new platform, has more potential for modification purposes in, in a lot of ways. In a few ways, it doesn't have as much potential in that, you know, obviously there's a lot of electronics on the new bike. So for guys who want to tear into the motor and, and rebuild it, you know, it's going to be a definitely a more complicated beast than the, the old Evo in that regard. But in a lot of other aspects, when you think about it, the fact that the bike's a relatively modular platform um, for Harley, since the engine's a stressed member, I mean, 
in theory, you could have, you know, a custom builder actually make a new subframe for the bike, you know? Um, and there's other aspects to the bike, general quality about it that makes it more suitable to certain categories that the Sportster previously, like you said, you could build it into anything, but there's actually a few limitations on it. It's a heavy bike, the old Sportster, you know, the new one's almost a hundred pounds lighter than the old one. Uh, and so that means that while you could make it look scrambler ish, you were taking a 570 pound bike. I mean, we all talk about the Pan Am being big, but at least the Pan Am has seven inches of suspension travel, you know, and at least it has a lot of the other things that would make it okay in the dirt. But you're so with a Sportster, it's going to still be, you know, a Sportster, but it's going to be 570 pounds and you're going to be trying to take it in the dirt. Another thing that the new platform has is a six speed transmission. So you can try to turn a Sportster into a commuter or a touring bike, like a long distance commuter or like a you know touring bike. And there's guys that obviously have ridden across the entire country on a, on a Sportster, but having that six speed transmission is something that's really, I think, impossible to basically add to a Sportster to my knowledge. But now on the new bike, you've opened up all these customization options that or these directions to go in as, as someone who wants to build a, a particular type of bike or build the new platform into a particular type of bike that the six speed allows for, the lighter weight allows for, and the modularity of the bike uh, allows for, since you're not really dealing with the constraints of, of a frame, you know? I guess what I'm saying is, you're, I mean, I'm all for the new frame It's a, or the new platform. It's a way better chassis. It's faster. It's better. But you just kind of lose that Sportster charm, you know? Like, for instance, that our new mechanic, his bike, it's a Sportster. It's a chopper. But the cool thing about his bike is you don't know, if you don't know the industry and, you, you know, at first glance, if you're some Joe Schmo and you look at his Sportster chopper, you don't know if it's from the 80s or, you know, it, it just has that cool charm, which I would miss, but you're you're 100% right. I mean, you got to evolve. Yeah, I mean, I think um, your point, Andrew, is there's a lot more just like right now market available parts to bolt yeah. up and there's a million things that you can do with the current air-cooled evolution engine. I think your point, Nick, is that the potential for customization is pretty great right now for, for the Rev Max platform. And although we don't have a whole lot of parts in the market right now, because they've only been out for a year, the potential for massive amounts of parts to be there is is big. The potential is very big. Let's talk a little bit about just, you know, stock to stock bikes, you know, so when the Sportster S came out, came in at 502 pounds, to your point, Nick, the Evo iron is a little under 600 pounds. So you're almost hundred pounds lighter for the Sportster S. And then the Nightster is even lighter than that. That's a sub 500 pound bike. So like you said, it's about hundred pounds less. And from a power standpoint, I mean, there's really no comparison at all. And you've got 121 horsepower being pumped out of the 1250T motor, stands for torque, which is a variation of the RevMax that we saw that was introduced on the Pan America. We first saw this platform being launched on the Pan America. And then we saw the Sportster S come out, I'm showing in July of 2021. So a little bit different head. A little bit different tune and, and cam on the Sportster S, tuned a little bit better for torque. You got 94 foot-pounds of torque, by the way, on the Sportster S. 12 to 1 compression ratio on the Pan America, you had a 13 to 1 compression ratio. But, you know, you got variable valve timing. It's a 60-degree water-cooled motor, revs out. It's, what is it, 9,000 RPM? Pan Am, I think it's like 9,000, 9,500. So, obviously, a lot higher revving engine than the air-cooled Evo because it is, you know, water-cooled, dual overhead cam. And so, just stop stock bike if you're buying a bike off the floor the new rev max platform absolutely destroys the the air cooled evo motor and, and that's something that i don't think can be overstated i mean i think that's where like a, a lot of potential confusion from a customer standpoint might come in where it's like okay i have these sportsters the iron 883 is left and the 48 is left and then i have the sport category on harley's website the sport category has the sportster s and it has the nightster okay how, how do these bikes match up against each other and that's really where i want the bulk of this conversation to go is if you're looking Looking, if you're shopping these bikes against each other based on what you're looking to get out of the motorcycle which direction should you go and i think the easy answer is probably well if you favor performance then go with the sports category the nightster or the sportster s and if you favor harley davidson's classic feel look and sound then maybe you're going to want to go to the air-cooled evo motor i kind of want to like touch on that from from personal experience like when i was in my metric days and i was going to the track a lot and, ha and owning metric bikes i had no clue or anything about harley davidson and i knew i wanted one what were you riding at the time uh, r1 so crazy fast sport bike yeah sport bikes i was canyons every weekend that guy you know and active track day guy daughter was born kind of wanted something you know something different i knew i wanted a harley had no idea with an what the heck would an fx was an fl every letter of the alphabet had no idea about harley davidson nothing the thing that was most inviting to me was 
and and something easy was Sportster. Sportster, Sportster, I mean, it was the introduction to the Harley family. All I know is it's a sport and it's, you know, it's a Harley Davidson and, you know, I'll buy one and then ride it for a year or two and kind of know the lingo and stuff like that and get familiar with the dealerships and kind of from there learn different models and so on and so forth and grow into this brand. I think not only the Sportster is more of an entry level or for me, it was an introduction to the Harley family. I was familiar with a Sportster. I'm going to get one. Didn't know anything about it. Loved the way it sounded and I knew I can customize it. And I bought it, and then a few short months, I was on a street bob. Just to give people some context, you were an advanced rider. Yeah. Coming off of an R1 1000cc liquid-cooled sport bike, which mm-hmm. is a very fast motorcycle, and then you went into a Sportster, you're mm-hmm. an advanced rider, and you grew out of that bike extremely quickly. 100%. And I just bought it because it sounded familiar, and it was a Harley, and it was priced really well. But And I bought it because I didn't know anything about Harley Davidson. I didn't know Dinas. I didn't know Street Bobs. I didn't know Softail. I, nothing. Yeah, you didn't watch Laidlaw's Harley Davidson YouTube channel. I did not, no. Yeah, so you weren't educated. So not I, think, I think this is a great point here because I think a lot of people share a similar story that you do, Andrew. Mm-hmm. And this is something we've said on the channel many times before. If you're an advanced rider and you're looking to do a lot of high speed and freeway riding, then the air-cooled Evolution Sportster definitely is not for you. Whereas the new RevMax Sportster, I would say, is a completely different story. Absolutely. This is a bike that if you have a high skill level, you can utilize that high skill level on a Sportster S. 100%. And you know, the next point, you have that six-speed transmission, just way more power. And um, it gives you just a lot higher ceiling for you to you know grow your ability if you're still advancing your skills. Whereas the Air-Cooled Evo, a lot of guys grow out of that bike. It's very much an entry-level gateway bike into the Harley world. Absolutely. And That's what I used it for. Yeah. And and the price reflects that too. I think uh, people, one of the big appeals for people is the price point on an Air-Cooled Evo Sportster. Mm-hmm. You know, the iron for the longest time I remember was 9999 bucks. Yeah. You know, now with, you know, some of the fees like, you know, surcharge and stuff, it's mm-hmm. closer to about 11 now. You know, a lot of people a lot of people are complaining about that. You know, we now will not have that low price point. Now the yeah. lowest price point motorcycle in the Harley world is going to be the Nightster at 13.5, which also, you know, matches the price of the soft tail standard that, that Nick was talking about as well. In fact, that kind of sparked some dialogue from Nick as well in terms of if you don't really want that liquid cooled feel and you want more of the traditional feel from a Harley Davidson, well, and you want that lowest price point at about 13.5, then you should strongly consider like a soft tail standard or, or a street bob. I think the motor company would say that the Sportster kind of found itself in a segment that it was never really intended to be. The motor company never envisioned the Sportster as like a learning bike. Entry level, yeah. Yeah, it's not an entry level learner bike. I mean, even if you just look at like the fit and finish of the the Sportster, like there's something that I would point out to customers back when I was selling bikes is like everything on that bike is metal. I mean, there's a reason that it's 100 pounds heavier than than the new RevMax bike. And obviously the RevMax bikes is, and all the RevMax bikes are leaning into performance and they're leaning into spec sheets and they're leaning into... We're going to go to toe toe to toe with all the manufacturers in this segment. We're tired of people pointing out that our motor is old, you know, even though that was in many cases kind of a deliberate choice. I don't think Harley ever envisioned the Sportster as this entry level bike. You know, it just happened to be the cheapest bike. And there was a lot of guys that are Harley enthusiasts and they want a Harley for their first bike. They don't want to spend a million dollars on their first bike. They don't want to be overwhelmed by a massive motor, right? And so they ended up going with a Sportster. But the reality is that, you know, as much as we look at the Sportster as this like bike that can be built into whatever you want, when it comes to actually building the bike as most, you know, humans, normal humans would do, a lot of the limitations of the Sportsters are are simply things that you can't do anything about other than just selling it and getting rid of. And the beauty of the new RevMax platform is that it doesn't have those weaknesses. It doesn't have the weakness of needing to do an engine rebuild on it in order to get enough power out of it to feel like you're comfortable doing 90 miles an hour down the freeway with your buddies who maybe have soft tails who are trying to push you into getting a bike originally so you bought the Sportster. It doesn't have the limitation of the the five-speed transmission. Really more of the mods that we're concerned about or that the average rider is going to be concerned about, I should say, are ergonomic things, you know, like, are there highway pegs available for it? Is there a sissy bar for it that I can put a, you know, a, a duffel bag on? Are there risers and handlebar options, which are things that are pretty easy for the aftermarket to get into quickly and things that in many cases Harley already has parts for. So it's become really, I think the, the Sportster question has become more how it was always intended to be. Do I want a faster, more performance focused bike like the Nightster? Or do I want something that's truer to the mechanical traditional feeling the excruciatingly 
fantastic build quality in terms of everything being metal for the same exact price point, you can get the soft tail standard. So now it makes more sense. You know, you're not picking a learner bike that you're going to trade in in six months versus the big bike that you're afraid of. It's now a question of, do I want, you know, a hundred horsepower or 120 horsepower and a sub 500 pound weight? Or do I want an air cooled 45 degree V twin with big torque, a lot of weight, but it's heavy because everything's made out of metal. And it's now not so much, uh, like I said, a question of what am I going to start on? It's what am I going to grow into? And I've always thought that that's like a better way to view it. What bike do you want to have for a while? And unfortunately, the Sportster's limitations were just difficult to overcome for a lot of customers. You know, it's like that five-speed transmission. I don't care what you do to the bike. It's going to be screaming down the down the highway if you're trying to keep up with your buddies on road glides. Yeah, good point. I mean, today when we were, you know, out on a ride, you know, I was on the Iron 83 at first and we had a, a live wire as our filming bike and the other bike was a Nightster and merging on the freeway, like, the iron couldn't even keep up. Yeah. You know, it's just so outclassed in every way. As much as I have kind of my heart is with the air cooled Evo motor and it will always, you know, be one of those like quintessential Harley Davidsons that, that checked off a lot of boxes that a lot of people enjoyed. I mean, Harley Davidson has sold over a million of them over the years. I think I read somewhere it's, it was time, you know, it was time for Harley Davidson to move on and it was time for them to really, you know, raise the bar in terms of performance. And to Nick's point as well, you know, when the Sportster first came about, I remember watching some of these videos of like Brad Richards where he said, you know, the Sportster was a giant killer. I mean, that was a very mm-hmm. fast bike that like, you know, whooped everybody's ass back in the day. And, and, and yeah, that's, and it fell out of grace slowly, but surely yeah. it didn't, it didn't keep up with the modern technology mm-hmm. and it slowly fell into this niche that, that Nick described uh, really well to this low price point learner bike that it was never really intended to be. I think we yeah. all really romanticize the evo sportster and we all want to exist like we want it to exist we want people to enjoy it we want people to appreciate it because we appreciate it and we enjoy it but then when the question comes for all of us do any of us want to actually own one i'd rather own a night sir we romanticize (laughs) we i think i romanticize about having like a built up sportster evo sportster like as it's been as we've known that it's not going to exist next year i'm like man i really want to get one on trade i mean the values are kind of high and it's like and then you're always asking me andrew is like well, what are you going to even, are you ever going to ride it? What are you gonna, is it when the yeah. Pan Am's sitting there, are you ever going to hop on it? And yeah. and the answer to that is no, but yeah. I still want it to exist. Yeah. Like I still love the idea Absolutely. of it. I still want it to be there. But yeah. the, the reality is that my weird romanticized version of what the Sportster is and could yeah. be, it's not what the average consumer who walks into the dealership is actually going to get. You yeah. know, they're not going to get the race tech yeah. hammer 1275 kit, you know, this, this insane thing I've invented in my head. That's not the Sportster. Yeah. The Iron 883 for the majority of people is what the Sportster is. Yeah. And living with that versus living with the Nightster, the new Nightster that is, it's totally different. You can, you can literally keep the new Nightster for years and be happy with it. Whereas for someone like us, we'd have an 883 and we'd either be tearing it apart to build it into something more what we want, or we'd be trading it in for a new soft tail. It's a novelty factor. You'd yeah. be riding that for the novelty factor of going down to your local yeah. restaurant bar and just showing off. It's like you owning, a, it's like owning a classic car. You, know, yeah. you buy a late sixties muscle car or something like that. And those are fast and they're great and everything, but just what you lose in ABS and modern Mm -hmm. suspension and everything like a halfway decent modern uh, Ford or Chevy, whatever Camaro is going to destroy those old muscle cars. And so it's it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, V6 Camry in in many cases (laughs) is going to beat those cars in most metrics. Yeah. I Um, think, you know, the the sports store lived long enough to just gain itself a negative stigma. It outlived its intention because everything just kind of progressed around it. Then it just fell into, like you said, exactly. the entry level bike. You know, yeah. your buddy's like, "Oh, you're gonna get, a, you're gonna learn how to ride," and you or your dad's gonna pick gonna, up a used Yeah, go get yourself a used Sportster for six grand. You know, and and you know, learn how to ride, drop it, and then sell it. Yeah, well, kind of speaking of that, that's a good segue for our next conversation because now I think by a lot of people's interpretation, Harley Davidson doesn't really have a true learner bike mm-hmm. anymore. I mean, the Iron was even kind of argumentative as far as whether that was a real learner bike or not. Mm-hmm. I would say in a lot of cases it probably wasn't just because I think the ideal learner bike is a beat up, you know, dirt bike or something like that. Absolutely. But now I think it's pretty easy to say that Harley Davidson doesn't really have a true learner bike, which my personal opinion, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, I, I don't feel like Harley Davidson needs to have a learner bike. Like Harley Davidson, in my opinion, isn't really a learner brand. And I'm not saying that to shun people that are new to the sport. I think the Nightster is a bike that is really easy to learn on. But, you know, again, we're now talking about 13.5 uh, as your very first motorcycle. I think I think you made a good point, uh, not to interrupt you, but yeah. um, I think that like 
The idea that Harley needs to have a learner bike, I think, is up for debate. I don't personally right. think that they need a learner bike any more than Ducati needs a learner bike or KTM needs a learner bike. You know, I mean, KTM has one kind of, but, you know, if you like learning how to wrench, it's a great option. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think, look, look at the Street 500. I mean, that was a core learner bike for Harley Davidson. And for their they were great for their school. And we had them on the floor. We sold them on the floor, but they didn't sell, was the problem. Well, you and, know. and if anything, you know, if you're worried that, the learner bike doesn't exist anymore as a brand new option in the Harley lineup because the price point went from 11 to 13, five. Like, yeah, I mean, that's a, a decent sized jump, but really it's not a huge, huge price difference. And I would say that the new Nightster has much better potential as being a learner bike. You know, while it doesn't make more horsepower, it's higher up in the RPM band. So you've got to find it if you want it. And then the bigger point for me is learner bikes for me, I, I want to have good electronics, which a pre-owned Sportster in many cases isn't even going to have ABS. Um, and even if you buy a new one, yeah, you can get ABS, but you can't get a rain mode. You can't get traction control on it. So those are things that you just, I, I, for me, if someone's learning to ride their first bike, it's that's a lot more important than the price point. Um, and then that's an important, yeah. Uh, and then thing. to go from there too, the weight, like getting that bike off the yeah. side stand. When and I first did it, the weight, yeah, the weight over the other side. Center of gravity is super low with that yeah. gas tank being underneath the seat. And yeah. then the weight itself is just a lot lower. And that, for me, like, you know, you know, all these people dropping bikes, it's because the bike gets to a certain point and all of a sudden you, that's when you feel the weight, you know? And that point is a lot further over for the Nightster than it is for even, you know, the 883. So I, I think I agree with you, Nick, and I, maybe I'll revise my statement. I, I think if you can swallow the 13.5 price point, other than that, the bike's actually a pretty dang good learner bike. Yeah. Um, and it also gives you a lot of room to grow into. I think you made a good point too, where it's a fast bike, but it also requires you to get that, that needle up there pretty high and know how to downshift and get into the power range. Yeah. But you learn on rain mode. Yeah, it, right. it has a really yeah. natural power band with a variable valve timing too. So a lot of like learner bikes too are bikes that actually kind of scare me from a learner standpoint, you know. Yeah. A lot of bikes that are low displacement, they make decent power numbers when you actually look at it. But if you actually look at how they develop that power, it's kind of sketch. It's like nothing, 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 nothing. And then you're at uh, 11,000 RPM and suddenly now you have horsepower, you know, or you're at 7,000 RPM. Now suddenly you have power with variable valve timing and 70 pound feet of torque. The nicer is not slow at 3000 RPM. It's just a lot more friendly than, um, than you might expect. And the power band's very linear with the variable valve timing. Yeah. And I think you brought up a good point of safety as well. I mean, just out on the freeway right now, you know, riding both of the bikes, the iron 883 combination of the suspension and just the fact that you don't have, you know, ABS on all the models, it's an option. And just, you know, things like the, the six axis IMU, which gives you a, a tailors, the ABS and traction control in the corners. I mean, those electronic, you know, intervention tools are, are pretty huge for a, a beginner. I just feel like more planted on the Nightster as well, like at high speeds as well. So having those things is, is huge for a beginner as well yeah stopping a lighter bike you know too if you're someone if you're trying to learn how to how to brake you know having a really nice set of brakes like you do on the on the nightster but more importantly having abs is really important and then just a lighter bike you just experience less weight transfer dynamically it's just a lot better on the brakes hard so like i grabbed a lot of front brake just to feel what it felt like versus a normal sportster the bike feels really really planted the front suspension is a lot better you get a lot less brake dive which is a combination of i'm sure of the improved suspension and the reduced weight for me that's it's just a lot more confidence inspiring under the brakes which is if you're learning to ride i want someone to be not at all scared to grab a lot of front brake which, and suspension yeah oh suspension in terms of just safety just on the comfort freeway. yeah i mean i was looking at the sheets because i this is the first time i rode the the nightster and i i've spent a lot of time on the 1.6 inch travel i think it's what it is on the Sportsters, the traditional Evo ones that are on the lower ride height. And those those bikes, they don't ride very well on the freeway. You know, expansion joints around here, you get a lot of front to rear movement. The front end's pretty soft and the rear is about as stiff as, as I've ever felt on any bike in existence other than a rigid. I looked at the spec sheet for the new Nightster and I was like, oh, Harley, you know, why did you have to go with a dual shock setup? You still have no travel. The bike's not going to ride really well. And then, and then I got on the freeway and, you know, it's not like my Pan Am. Obviously, that's cheating with seven inches of travel, but I was surprised. I was like, this rides way better than the spec sheets suggest. And I don't know if it's a lighter spring because they've decided if you're going to ride up, you know, two up on this bike, you're going to have to dial in some preload. But I don't know what they did. But despite not having tons more travel, because I think it's only maybe like 2.2 or 2.3 inches, it's a lot better. Although I, I will say sometimes like the measurements can trip you up. If you look at the percentages, it's kind of different. So let's say it is two inches of travel and the original is 1.6. I mean, what is that? Like 25% more travel. When you look at the, the percentage side of things, it, maybe it makes more sense. But I just was kind of disappointed originally with the, the specs of the suspension. And I took it out on the freeway and I realized that's why you never judge a book by its spec sheet. You know, I, I have to say I was really surprised. I got the opportunity to go to the media event in Santa Barbara and ride the, the night steering. We went up 
you know, to Ojai, you know, out there by Santa Barbara. And as, as someone who's riding for a long time, I would consider myself, you know, above an intermediate rider. I had a lot of fun on that bike. I didn't feel like it was limiting at all, you know, in the twisties and everything. Is it a bike that, you know, complements most of my riding habits as a common distance rider? Probably not, but to, to rip it around and to get in that power band, it was pretty dang nice and it was a lot of fun. And I was surprised at the ergonomics too. You know, obviously I'm too tall for most bikes at six foot six, but even that bike fit me pretty dang well. Yeah. And they hardly even said that the, the rider triangle, the measurements between you know, your hand controls, uh, your foot and your seat are mimic the iron 883. And so I feel like it's kind of a one size fits all where most people can get on it and feel pretty dang good, pretty dang comfortable. And so I think it's a great all around bike, especially if you are buying it or, you know, the, the use case in which it's intended, which would be, you know, local rides, you know, only got a, a 3.1 gallon fuel tank, which is slung low, like Nick said, underneath the seat there, you know, even though it's, you know, high 400s weight, it's also a low slung weight. So very easy to bike to pick up off the side stand and everything. But let's kind of transition a little bit now to the Sportster S. So Harley Davidson came out with the Sportster S as like their flagship Sportster. Hey, we're going to introduce the, the new sports, the new era of Sportsters with the Sportster S. And they wanted to make it radical looking and they wanted to give it all of the the electronics and the features from the brakes to the suspension and i feel like that they did that in a big way they infused some flat track styling into it with the high mount exhaust it's got this big fat you know rear tire on it it, it does a lot of things and you're about fifteen hundred dollars more than the nightster and personally if i were going to buy a, a sportster right now today with the four bikes we have the two air cooled and then the two liquid cooled, I would definitely do the, the Sportster S just because I feel like I would want that extra power. You're also adding larger TFT screen with the Sportster S. You know, you're you're going up to 120 horsepower. Whereas on the, the Nightster, what did we say the Nightster was? 90. 90 horsepower. Um, so more power. You're also adding, you know, inverted front end on the Sportster S. And you have a mono shock on the Sportster S as well, which honestly, I felt like that was a little bit rougher ride than the Nightster was. I feel like the Nightster maybe is just a softer ride and so it may have dialed in more preload too it's always tough to compare on that um especially yeah. when you're riding a bike that's not yours and and you don't have an opportunity to set it up for yourself that's true and what, what do you guys think uh, in terms of if someone decided hey i want a sportster i want it to be on the new rev max platform what are some of the guidance that you guys would give people to determine whether I, they should buy the sportster s or the nightster for me personally i would actually go with the nightster over the sportster s based upon my riding and i'll kind of break that down so you can kind of think through my my decision making process but the rider triangle on the sportster s is a, a little bit different you know with the forward controls but i'd say for me the big difference would be just getting the bike into a, a, a position that would be more of a swiss army knife i feel like the the sportster s is kind of locked into that muscle cruiser bar hopper kind of avenue a little bit more because it has the unique styling cues that don't lend well to big changes that would make the bike a little bit more capable on the highway. So like, for example, if I had a, a Nightster, I would figure out a way to get a quarter fairing on there. I would want some sort of sissy bar so that I could get a duffel bag on there. I would either do, a, a, you know, some sort of a highway peg setup potentially so I can stretch out on the longer rides and then maybe a slightly taller bar and riser setup. And at that point I would have an extremely light bike still has plenty of power for cruising on the highway with 90 horsepower. It would be great in the canyons. I'd have a normal tire setup, unlike the Sportster S, which has got that bigger tire profile. And I'd have more options for customization, I think, down the road, just because the Sportster S, in my, my mind, is just going to have more bespoke parts to that particular bike. I think they really wanted a striking motorcycle. So I think that, you know, that fender setup on the rear is going to make it difficult to get a variety of exhaust pipes developed for it. I've seen like TBRs pipe for it and it, it just looks kind of weird because you've got the overlay flap that kind of goes over the stock pipe. The TBR doesn't really fill that very well. So it just kind of like comes up at a, a different angle. I don't know there's just more things on that bike, kind of like how the FXDR was and kind of how the V-Rod was. That means that you're going to have less applicable parts, I think, to it. And while you do make more power and the torque is nice and a lot of the electronics, uh, like the dash is really nice. For me, I want like a Swiss Army knife of a bike. And I feel like the Nightster takes everything about the Sportster that I already loved, light, nimble, great runaround bike and with the six speed and the extra power it means that if you can get some wind protection on there and some sort of luggage capacity you could actually ride that thing on your your overnight trips with your buddies um, with no no qualms at all so so yeah you're looking at things from a standpoint of how can i make this morph it into a bike that is going to be suitable for my riding needs yeah i mean i just imagine that you know if you're buying something in that category um you're probably going to want a bike that does a lot of things well you know um that 
you know, you could potentially tour on if you needed to, but, um, it's going to commute well. It's going to go over the canyons with your buddies. Well, um, all, all of which the, the sports are S does well, but it, I think it kind of falls apart when you decide to take it on longer trips. Cause a lot of the mods that you would need to do that either might not exist or be really difficult to execute on. You know, the new Nightster is really designed to be a platform that allows you to customize it however you want. For sure. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think you bring up a good point that if you're going to modify the, the two bikes quite a bit, the Nightster is definitely the one to go with if you're going to change things out a bunch. The Sportster S, in my opinion, yeah, it's a bike that you buy. You don't do a whole lot to maybe change the grips and change the pegs and stuff like that because... Yeah, it's got the bigger tire on there. It's got a unique exhaust. It's going to be hard for the aftermarket companies to make, you know, exhaust just for one model because they'll probably have no other models like that. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think w when I was coming at it and I choose a sports dress, I was thinking about it. If I was just going to buy the bike and ride it for a local ripper, you know, go up the canyons and things like that. But no, you bring up a good point with the with the customization ease with, yeah. the, with the Nightster. It's going to be something that we all kind of have to keep framing our head around is we all have these kind of certain pigeonholed ideas as to what the Sportster is and what it's capable of and who we can recommend it to. And I think the new RevMax platform kind of throws that all out the window. I mean, you put, think about it. The, put the sport back in Sportster. Yeah. Well, and, and it actually, it put, for me, it put the, it put the utility, it put the, the limitless mindset back in there. Like I was, I always felt it was such a pigeonholed bike because of its output and because of its transmission. Yeah. Um, and now those, those limits, those things that were really hard limits in many cases, are gone you know and you can kind of build it into what you want now yeah what about you which which one are you putting in your garage i'd go personally nightster pretty much to bounce off nick where we we share a lot of similarities with motorcycles and everything like that and just ergonomics to the nightster it was funny when i first got on the nightster i expected to bring my leg up higher to be on the peg when in reality sat lower i was expecting to be more crunched on it which mm -hmm. i wasn't I was more crunched on the iron, just simply where they mounted the pegs. Yeah. For me, the ergonomics on the sports to rest doesn't really jive with me and my body style. I don't really straddle that bike really well. Forward bars and then front con forward controls, just kind of clamshell. Yeah. yeah, just a clamshell kind of feel. Didn't really care for it. And I felt like the bars on the Knights, they were still kind of too far forward. And I'd like a little taller riser on it. But for the most part, I mean, stock for stock. Sportster S to the Nightster. I like the Nightster. It has yeah. plenty of power. When we took it out right now, I put it in road. Well, I started off in sport and then put it in road. Sport mode, you know, coming from the Pan America, you know, just very familiar with that and, and the engine tuning and mapping all that. The sport mode really turns on that 975. Yeah. You know, it it really wakes it up. I liked it better in road mode. I mean, going up Azusa just was a lot better. The bike just takes on a different characteristics, obviously. I mean, it's more tamed. It's not just jolty and jerky, but man, the brake feel on that, like it just yeah. outshines the iron in every way. The Iron 83 I had in yeah. uh, original mode. Yeah, yeah, the OG mode. <laughs> yeah, OG, OG mode yeah. was the road, the mode I was running <laughs> in the Iron 87, 37 years of Evo mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the horsepower on a 883? I mean, it's got to be like, it's like 50 or 35. Yeah. Like 44 or something. Yeah. Is it yeah. 44? And the Knights here, we're talking about 90, you know, so you're... 20% you know, less weight. <laughs> Yeah, so 20% less weight, and you got double the horsepower. So I want everybody to give their final thoughts. So my final thoughts, if you're looking at you know these four bikes right now, the Iron, the 48, and then the Sportster S and the Nightster, I'll just kind of say what we've already said, but in, in a nutshell, I would say that, hey, if you're looking for a bike that is a classic Harley-Davidson that has a lot of parts that can be added to it, bolt-on parts that are available on the market right now, and you want that classic look and sound and feel of a Harley-Davidson where you spin that throttle, with some radical aftermarket exhaust on there, like it, you got that Harley sound that's undeniable. Then the air-cooled Evolution motor is a great bike and, and a good platform to, to pick up if you want to tinker on it and things like that. If you're looking for a bike to just buy, ride it right out of the box. Yes, there will be more parts coming out in the near future to Nick's point, but if you want a bike to, to ride right out of the box, maybe you're a little bit more experienced rider and you're going to be going a lot of freeway and things like that, the new RevMax platform is definitely the way to go, especially with all the electronics, the better brakes on it, the better suspension especially if you're getting the sportster s you know you got the inverted front end and everything then that would be the the direction that i would lean you in i have the pan america everybody in this room has you know either currently owned or has owned pan americas and 
the new Rev Max is, dude, every time I get on it, I'm just like, wow, this thing is awesome. And so that, that would be my advice. For me, I'd say that uh, there are very few people I would recommend an air-cooled Sportster to anymore. The reason being is that with the recent price bumps, it's gotten very close to the Softail standard price point. And I feel that for that extra two grand, depending on the model, you're getting a lot more bike with the Softail standard than you're getting with the 883 or... Uh, even something like the 48. And if you wanted that air-cooled traditional view, uh, you know, uh, traditional experience with that, the fit and finish that you're expecting from like a super high-end premium cruiser and you're willing to sacrifice a little bit on the weight and it's going to be, you know, you know it's going to be heavier than the than the Nightster, you know it's going to be a little bit less powerful than the Nightster, a little bit slower than the Nightster, then I'd say go the, with the direction of the Softail standard. And then if you're someone who wants a little bit more performance, obviously, you understand that in order to make a bike that's sub 500 pounds, it's going to have to have a little bit more plastic on it. Although, uh, you know, the, the air box and the fenders are still metal and the fit and finish is still quite good. Then I would go in the direction of the, of the new RevMax platform. The only person I would really recommend a Sportster to is someone who has that romanticized view of the Sportster that we have and wants to buy a bike, kind of have it be a project bike, keep it forever, build it up, do, do whatever they want. And they want that blank canvas. They want a known quantity that has a lot of parts available for it. But those people are few and far between. You know, when we sell Sportsters, we're selling them to, to newer riders usually younger and, guys, yeah. yeah younger guys that are just getting into into the motorcycle world and I, honestly i spent a lot of time discouraging them from buying sports because they would tell me what they want to do with it well i want to go right my buddies all have dinos and, and they, they ripped to vegas and i was like okay don't don't buy this bike you <laughs> yeah. know you're going to be back here in six months and i'll make commission off you twice if you want but i just know you're where you're going to be and the yeah. reality is that you're going to be much better off buying you know a soft tail or something now i have the option of being like well you like the looks of this and you, you tell me, you know, you're a newer rider. Let's, let's look at the Nightster right here because the Nightster is going to be a great option. It's going to have that lightweight, you know, thing that you're looking for. It's going to have a lot of safety features that the iron doesn't have. And it's going to be a great bike for you to learn on and grow into. And when your buddies do hop on their dinos and go to Vegas, you're not going to feel like you can't keep up. In fact, you're going to be probably pulling them along. So yeah, yeah. yeah and before you go into your uh, final thoughts, Andrew, I think Nick touched on something that I, I meant to spend a little bit more time on, and that is just the overall aesthetics and look of the two bikes. You know, yeah. you have a lot more, you know, wires, you know, people will argue that the left side of the Rev Max is really busy and has a lot of things going on, whereas you look at the air-cooled Evo Sportster and just the, the wire height, the wire hygiene, yeah. everything is just a lot nicer and yeah. just more clean and classic than the Rev Max. It's because the Rev Max has got a lot more going on, a lot more electronics. It's just a much more yeah. sophisticated bike. A lot more sophisticated cat bike, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think Nick's point is is spot on and great. You know, I've spent plenty of time out on the floor, you know, discouraging people from an air-cooled Sportster as well, you know, mostly based on just the riding experience. Yeah. But I think that is, you know, something of note. To, to consider, you know, just the classic look and appeal of the air-cooled Evo motor again, which, in my opinion, doesn't really trump the fact that the RevMax still, in every measurable way, to just buy, ride it right out of the box, still far. I mean, we're not, it's not even close. It's just far superior. The aesthetics and the fit and finish of the of the new Nightster is what you would expect from that price point of bike. I think the thing is for us is like we're used to looking at the iron, which is kind of a freak of nature at that price point in terms of it being entirely made of metal. None of its competitors are built like to a standard even remotely close to how the old iron yeah. is built. And I think it's because partly because it's just a product of like a previous time, you know, and it didn't right. make sense to go in and re-engineer it to make it cheaper. And I'm sure that Harley makes very little money on that bike just based on the fit and finish of it, because I look at it, you know, we get $25,000 gold wings, you know, traded in and next to the iron, I mean, they do not look nice. I personally have, I spent way more on the highest end Italian bike that you could possibly buy. And it looks like a Fisher Price toy next to you know, an Iron 883. Yeah. And yeah. the new, you know, Nightster looks just as well made as, as my high end Italian bike. But I think just because it's like we're so used to this like freak of nature that the iron is in, in the world of consumer goods currently. Yeah. Um, nothing is built to that standard anymore. And honestly, I, I don't want them to build it that way just because I want the bike to be lighter. I want them to push the performance boundaries. And you just simply can't do that with a 570 pound bike i'm happy that they made the design choices that they did and they went in the direction that they did but it, it does you know it, it, there's something about looking at the fit and finish of an iron and going whoa you can appreciate I, it. yeah you're like that is that is a impeccably built bike metal controls metal everything and yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's an incredible bike to i'll look just at. i'll just scratch the surface on this real quick i think we're seeing a shift in consumer as well and this can be a whole nother separate video you know or maybe the baby boomers they you know prioritize that real clean fit and finish and everything of the highest quality whereas the consumer consumers nowadays, maybe with the, the Gen Z's and everything, they prioritize the, the speed and the spec sheet and, you know, the performance of everything and the electronics a lot more than 
you know, my dad's generation did. Nobody so. acknowledges the fit and finish of that bike. Nobody acknowledges fit and finish yeah, on yeah. pretty much anything other than as like a, a glance over. They're like, oh, fit and finish. It's like, I don't think that people understand yeah. how expensive it is to do good paint and make everything out of metal. Like it's, it's way more expensive than putting traction control on a bike. Oh yeah. Like it's, it's underappreciated. Harley yeah. Davidson's fit and finish is super underappreciated. And I feel like yeah. Harley Davidson Motor Company could do a lot better job at promoting that and really showcasing it because you know, these bikes that may beat Harley on, on the spec sheet, yeah. you know, their fit and finish isn't anywhere near in, yeah. in it, some cases. Yeah, getting a off the, off the shelf, you know, six axis IMU from Bosch and doing the, the programming, you know, for the bike is it's like, it's not the same as when you look at like a soft tail and you're like, whoa, like the, the paint the fit and finish, everything being made out of metal, that, that stuff is expensive. Like, it's yeah, very no, expensive. No welds, no cords yeah. anywhere, you know, wiring's all clean. So I, I you know, I, I wish people paid more attention to that and prioritize that more, but I also have to acknowledge that they don't. And the motor company has to fight on spec sheets now. Well, I think, I think you appreciate it once you've owned a Harley because mm -hmm. I've had people own Harleys and they go buy like a Polaris or, um, you know, whatever. And then they come back and it's like, yeah, this is a lot nicer product. I think what it is mostly is you can't really tell fit and finish from behind an iPhone screen, but it's yep. easier to demo technology and ABS through filming a video. You know, and most of the people that don't appreciate the fit and finish never have stepped foot in a Harley Davidson dealership and sat on a bike. Yeah. You know, they, they look at the YouTube videos and they see these guys reviewing the bikes, but you can't really tell. They'd, they're not sitting on the bike and feeling everything and, and just how premium everything is when you're sitting on cockpit of a, an iron or, you know, street light or whatever. But yeah. Final thoughts on the bike, touching back and kind of mirroring what you guys are saying about this whole um, Sportster and Nightster thing. I mean, you're right. I mean, I spend most of the time talking guys out of a sportster because they come from the dirt bike scene or they've been riding ATVs or whatever have you, and they have some riding experience. I walk them back to the used bikes and show them that 80% of my sportsters have less than 2,000 miles, and that person is generally upgraded to a street bob or a Dyna or like a Heritage or something rather. So as much as I appreciate and like the iron and what it's done for the company and still currently doing as of right now, it's obviously time to evolve it is a lot about performance and just riding both bikes is just enough said i mean you get on the the nights there and that thing just boogies and it does everything well and you ride the iron and it it shows you its age absolutely you, know? you ride it back to back and it's just like oh my gosh yeah, <laughs> yeah. this thing it's time has come yeah all right guys well thanks a lot for watching this video hopefully you learned something and hopefully if you're looking for a new bike in this class between the air-cooled evo motors and the new rev max sportsters hopefully we helps you figure out exactly you know what direction to go in if you're looking for a new motorcycle in southern california make sure you hit us up here at laid laws harley davidson if you haven't already make sure you hit that subscribe button we'll see you on the next video guys later